Welcome back to the third season of 12 Days in March. I'm taking a little break from class preparation to update our video collection. In this video, we'll review the key features of SLE and the closely related N-phospholipid antibody syndrome that you will need to know for the USMLE Step 1 exam. As with all presentations, a PDF of this recording is available at the 12 Days website. And to be aware that 12 Days is now offering tutorial services, details of which are available at the website. Alright, let's get started. We'll start with the basics, and in case you didn't know, SLE is pretty damn exciting at the NBME because it is the prototypic type 3 hypersensitivity reaction. They like prototypic. Type 3 refers to immune complex deposition, but I don't want to take that little tidbit for granted as I see too many students struggle in distinguishing type 2 and type 3 hypersensitivity. First off, SLE has three letters to signify type 3. That alone should get you there. But let's explore where those immune complexes come from. This graphic, shared by one of my colleagues in rheumatology, is one of the easiest, most straightforward slides you'll ever see during board preparation on pathogenesis. So we'll start at the left part of the slide. A cell dies. Check. DNA is released. Check. An autoantibody is formed in a genetically susceptible individual, and on the boards, that genetically susceptible individual will be a young female. The anti-DNA immune complex then circulates until it is deposited in vulnerable organs, with the glomerulus being particularly vulnerable, as depicted in this image. Complement is then activated, resulting in inflammatory disease of the end organ, which we'll cover shortly. This is lovely and straightforward. And here is a pictorial representation of that process, an immunofluorescence demonstrating the granular appearance of immune complexes being deposited in the glomerulus. Let's take a quick moment and compare this process with type 2 hypersensitivity reactions. Type 2 are described as an immune attack against fixed tissue targets. You need to be able to repeat and understand that like gospel. It isn't going away. Here are the type 2 prototypes including Graves disease, good pastures, rheumatic fever, and myasthenia gravis not pictured. Although the antibody does circulate, it is directed against a fixed tissue target, be it the TSH receptor, glomerular basement membrane, or cardiac valves. Of these, rheumatic fever is the most troublesome as students confuse the valvulitis, which is a type 2 hypersensitivity reaction, with post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis, which is type 3. Although both disorders are immune manifestations of streptopyogenes, they represent different entities with different immune mechanisms of damage. Be sure to understand this distinction. So I'd be totally psyched if you got nothing further from this discussion other than the difference between type 2 and type 3 hypersensitivity reactions. But of course, we have much more. Moving along, SLE is also the prototypic multi-system disorder. So here's the good news. You will never struggle to make the diagnosis. On the boards, patients with SLE come in with big tattoos that say SLE. Here's an example of one of those tattoos. I designed it myself. Not to be too facetious, but the diagnosis will be obvious. We'll review those criteria, but the money will be with the derivatives. So let's make the diagnosis. There are 11 overall manifestations represented by four skin, five organ systems, and two laboratory criteria. Pictured here are the four dermatologic manifestations. Of the four skin criteria, malar rash is the most classic. You can anticipate the description of an erythematous rash on the nasal bridge spreading to the cheeks. This description will be followed by an SLE derivative. The other dermatologic manifestations include photosensitivity rash, aphthous ulcer, or discoid rash. These may be mentioned cueing you into the SLE diagnosis, but don't expect any specific questions in reference to these skin findings. If any of these are even mentioned, there will be ample other signs and symptoms of SLE to make the diagnosis, so you only need vague familiarity with these criteria. Here are the five organ systems to be familiar with. Don't get a rash that refer to serosa as an organ system. That's funny, rash, get it? Insofar as the joints, these patients will be described by pain and swelling of the fingers. This is in contradistinction to rheumatoid arthritis affecting the MCP and wrist. You'll have no trouble making this distinction. Insofar as CNS involvement, I don't think I've ever seen a lupus question. If CNS is mentioned, it will likely be in the form of embolism in the setting of Lippmann Sachs endocarditis mentioned later in this presentation. The kidney is tricky, but in a good way. There is no single entity that defines lupus nephritis. In fact, there are at least six classes of renal involvement with multiple subclasses. 
Your job is to be familiar with the idea of immune complex deposition in the subendothelial space resulting in a proliferative response. I will not harp on this in greater detail as the board favors other entities such as post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis when discussing proliferative glomerulonephritis. The glomerulopathies will be addressed in detail in a separate video. Pleuritis and pericarditis are common. The pericarditis generally presents with an effusion that is not symptom limiting. As reviewed in the videos on pericardial diseases, SLE and pericardial effusions are low yield, but you should at least be familiar with the association. And finally, hematologic involvement is a big ticket item, especially autoimmune thrombocytopenia. We'll review this further in our platelet series, but this is the one hematologic manifestation of lupus you are likely to see alone or in combination with the antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. So we have reviewed four dermatologic manifestations and five organ systems. The remaining criteria involve the lab. A positive ANA is present in 98% of lupus patients. Thus, it is considered a sensitive test. It lacks specificity as 10% of the normal population have a positive test. A positive ANA test, however, is considered one of the 11 diagnostic criteria. There are a variety of other tests, including anti-double-stranded DNA. Whereas this test lacks sensitivity, it is considered highly specific. It is worth holding on to this little nugget of information. On the other hand, don't waste your time learning patterns of ANA tests, such as homogenous versus speckled. This is fodder for your rheumatology boards, not step one. And here are the other labs. If any one of them are positive, it is considered the 11th and final diagnostic criteria. Whereas there is little action on single-stranded DNA and anti-Smith, the thrombophilia labs get quite a bit of action on the boards. They're not actually called thrombophilia labs, but if a lupus patient presents positive for either of these three, they have a 50% risk of forming a blood clot. These tests themselves become targets of questions on the boards, and we'll cover them shortly in the context of antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. So there you have it. We just reviewed the diagnostic criteria for SLE. A patient is considered to have lupus if five of the 11 criteria are positive. However, as I said five hours ago, the diagnosis will really be puzzling. So what are those derivatives? The first and easiest derivative is drug-induced lupus. This should be pretty straightforward as long as you can remain vigilant. Here is the trap. They won't mention the offending agent by name. For instance, and the classic agent would be procainamide, they will say a patient has a cardiac arrhythmia and is started on an agent that widens the QRS complex. They go on to develop an erythematous facial rash. Which of the following tests, including antihistone antibody, would be most useful in making the diagnosis? The tricky feature is recognizing the description of procainamide. Let's delve further into the next derivative. These are the lupus-related thrombophilic blood tests. As for the antibodies, they are pretty much as they sound. Antibodies directed against phospholipid antigens, including cell membranes and circulating phospholipid complexes. The clinical picture in these patients is completely characteristic. Recurrent miscarriage, autoimmune thrombocytopenia, in vitro elevation of the activated partial thromboplastin time, and paradoxical thrombosis. The thrombosis can either be venous or arterial, which makes them relatively unique. You are expected to recognize this pathognomonic clinical description. Insofar as terminology, you won't have to name the antibody per se, but you should be familiar with the confusing nomenclature. The most important antibody to be familiar with is anticardiolipin. This is the antibody largely responsible for the antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. Beta-2 glycoprotein 1 is the target of this antibody. Beta-2 glycoprotein does have a minor regulatory role in the coagulation cascade, so autoantibodies predispose to thrombosis. For completeness, the patient can independently develop antibody against beta-2 glycoprotein. These are distinct from anticardiolipin. You'll need this information for the boards, but these antibodies are an important part of the antiphospholipid antibody literature. Moving along to the false positive RPR, as many as 20% of SLE patients will cross-react on RPR testing. This occurs because the antigen used in testing for syphilis has cardiolipin present. The questions will not be mysterious. They will directly inform you of a positive syphilis antigen test and highlight a negative antibody test as illustrated in this slide. This pattern of discordant results is the language of false positive testing. When they supply this information, they are specifically telling you the patient either has SLE or antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. And finally, the lupus anticoagulant. This is the most confusing concept for students for a couple of reasons. First, 
we are discussing blood tests that cause clotting, so why is this called an anticoagulant? Then, they don't understand how a patient can develop blood clots if the PTT is elevated. That would suggest a bleeding problem such as hemophilia or von Willebrand's disease, right? So let's clear the deck and try and understand this apparent paradox. In this graphic, we take a look at how the PTT is measured in the laboratory. Got that? In vitro. The patient's serum is added to a contact system that includes phospholipid. This procedure activates the coagulation cascade. Ultimately, prothrombin is converted to thrombin and a clot is formed. The PTT measures, in seconds, how long this process takes. That makes sense, but consider what happens if we introduce interfering antibodies. In the right graphic, you can now see a patient with antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. Antibodies are present that interfere with the phospholipid component of the test, causing a delay in clot formation. That is, the PTT will be prolonged. It is important to your understanding of this condition that this is a laboratory phenomenon alone. Clinically, these patients present with thrombotic complications. So why is it called lupus anticoagulant? Unfortunately for students, historically it was known that some patients with SLE had prolongation of PTT long before the concept of antiphospholipid antibodies was discovered. The name has simply stuck. Here I propose a new name for this test that will clear up any confusion generated by the phrase lupus anticoagulant. The new name is prolonged PTT in some patients with SLE due to circulating antibodies against phospholipid with a seemingly paradoxical increased risk of clotting. But it isn't really paradoxical because those antibodies activate platelets, among other things. Any questions about this new name? And here is a summary of what we just reviewed about the antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. Please be familiar with the clinical description as it will be a gateway to a rich source of derivatives that the NBME can hardly resist. And our final derivative is Lipman Sachs endocarditis. As you can see, as many as 10% of SLE patients and 30% of antiphospholipid patients are found with these lesions. Of course, the incidence is not important for the boards, but the key derivative is to know the pathologic description and consequence of these lesions. To make this easy, let's kill the eponym and look at some other descriptive terms. Given their wart-like appearance, they are sometimes referred to as verrucous endocarditis, and you should be aware of this label as it can appear as an answer option, and it is easy to envision these wart-like lesions embolizing. And embolization is a big ticket item. The other term you will see is non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis. And this is the favorite term as it not only offers a pathologic description, but underscores the main clinical risk, thrombi with embolization. The pathologic description of these microthrombi include immune complexes and mononuclear cells that cause aggregates of fibrin and platelet thrombi. Got that? Sterile vegetations made up of platelet and fibrin aggregates. And that, my friends, is the whole enchilada. Let's summarize what we just covered. In this video, we reviewed SLE as the prototypic immune complex disorder, emphasizing type 3 hypersensitivity while comparing in contrast with the type 2 disorders. We reviewed the key diagnostic criteria, including four skin, five organ system, and multiple laboratory manifestations. And we emphasize the key derivatives with an emphasis on the antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, which is a rich source of test materials. And along the way, we designed a beautiful tattoo, which is available for purchase at the 12 Days website. Just kidding. It won't be available till next month. If you have any questions or concerns, please email me at 12 Days in March. Thank you.